Okay. So last week we um can someone just do a recap of last week's session? Um Diola, can you just give us like two minute session of what you learned last week? And um Ayan Bini, you can also help Diola's out after her own talk. So let's start. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll try. Um uh, hi everyone on the call. Um so last week we talked about intro to cybersecurity. We talked about the goals of cybersecurity where we, we or where you <laughs> rather, <laughs> where you highlighted um, the three goals of um, cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, and you know, you dissected confidentiality um, meaning secure, um, securing data, which can only be authorized by one person or people that have access to the data. Um, we talked about integrity, that, uh, you know, not integrity of data, that means um, the data cannot be tampered with um, for whatever reason. And we talked about availability of data when, you know, like, just like assessing the data when it's needed, you know, and availability can be malicious or non-malicious. Um, we also talked about the value of data, what you said you're going to buttress or expand on that, uh, of the ash value, sorry, <laughs> the ash value of the data, right? So you said you're going to expand on that um, today. We talked about um, the structures or team structures um, on the cybersecurity. We have the red, which is the offensive, the purple, data collision and implementation, blue, defensive or protect team. Um, I could go for that, but like, I don't know how long you want me to <laughs> continue. Uh, I can't hear you, I think you on mute. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, I am Bimi, can you just um, All you know, right. conclude this for Adela? She has really tried. Can you hear us, I am Bimi? Okay, I guess it is melted. All right, not a problem. Yeah, Diola, thank you for so much for the um, recap. I mean, yes. So just like Diola said last week, we discussed about what cybersecurity is all about. It goes of cybersecurity, which is the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We talk about different roles in cybersecurity. We also discussed about um, certifications you can, you know, venture into. And last week we agreed that we're going to be using Triacme for um, the mentorship training part. However, during the course of the week, it was even a girl that made us understand that Triacme is not totally free. You won't have access to some of the course material except you pay, right? And I said, okay, I'm going to maybe change or diverse the um, mentorship track parts and come up with something we can work on without having to pay. However, I can, I would advise us if you think you have the funds, I think it's about eight pounds or eight dollars per month, right? If you think you have one month where you can actually dedicate at least two, three hours every day to studying, I would advise that you pay for the um, Triacme um, um, learning part, right? Just for your personal study. Uh, like I said, we won't use that again. But for your personal study, you, you can actually, um, you know, pay for one month subscription fee and um, do some courses on try at me. However, I've tried as much as possible to see how we can continue the cybersecurity session without having to pay a dime during the uh, mentorship session. But the truth is, as I was looking out for tools and the likes, for further, for further study, right, especially if you've not gotten a job yet in cybersecurity, I think you might still have to pay for some courses just to get access to labs and everything. 
But for this bicycle session training, we will definitely have some hands-on lab as well. I will show you some things that I do at work, although it's confidential. But I will try as much as possible not to show you the confidential information around that, but just to give you some real life scenario and you can actually like have idea, not even idea, look, you can, how do I put it? Not have idea about it, but you can actually picture what it looks like to be a security analyst or a security engineer and the like. So um, last week I said I was going to show, we talked about integrity. And um, like I said, integrity is ensuring that a file has not been modified, right? Say for instance, if I, if I send this particular week um, slide to you and um, somebody, okay, for instance, I send you the, the, the link and if anybody modified any of the team, maybe for instance, the way I changed the date from 1st of April, or what was last week date? And um, 3rd of April to, to 10th of April, right? If you compare the, the file integrity, you will definitely see a change. And that is what we call like file hash. File hash is a 128-bit character length, fixed length. So for instance, if I change this character letter C to a small letter C, and I try to compare the integrity of the file, you will definitely see that the, the, hash, the hash key changes. Even if you change one, a small letter to a character letter, you've alternate, you've alternated the file, you've modified it. And for, for security controls, that's mean that means the integrity of the file has been violated. And I, like I promised, I was going to show us something. And so let me just quick, quickly do a quick demo before we move into, the, into to, to this session. Um, so an example will be um, let's just look at the integrity of a particular file on my document. Okay, I have a notepad file, a text document, Abascos, right? And um, let me, my PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, right? So I want to check the integrity of this Abascos file is on my document, right? So let me change directly to documents, right? And what was, I got, did I forget the, Okay, guess file hash. Okay, guess file hash of this document, right? Abbas cause dot txt. Okay. Sorry. Let me skip this. Um get fine ash of this particular document here. Um bus course dot cft. Okay, can we see the ash file? It's B319 something something, right? Let me take a screenshot of this snippet to yeah. of this particular file ash, right? And let's leave it here. Now I'm trying to change, let me open the content of this Abascos document, right? And change this security analyst to capital letter security analyst. See, I didn't even try to change anything, but I'm only changing a small cap to a cap to a capital letter, right? Control S. That means it's still the same as the security analyst. Now let's try and get the, um, the final of that same file to check the integrity of the file. I saved it to this. Come back in and do get 
Kailash. There's a mistake. Okay. Oh, thank you. Right. Now, I want us to compare the two results. Um, can you still see my screen? Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. If you notice that the the ash file, like I said, look at it. This the first one was IT security analyst, right? However, with um, a small letter, I mean, lowercase, right? And what I did was just to change the lowercase to uppercase. I did not even delete any other thing from the documents. And when I now try to get the file, the ash um, value of that particular, of the new, of the new document, it's way different. Can you see? This one is B319. This is the 125K character length. And this one is ACC4. That means the integrity of the file has been violated. Somebody has done something. And as small as changing a small, a lowercase to uppercase, violated the file integrity. And so, like I would say, like I said, it might be for malicious or, or legitimate purpose. So for instance, I sent you the documents, our presentation document, and you feel like, oh, Ellie made a mistake from 10th of April, she rose 1st of April, and you just change to 10th of April, you have modified the integrity of the file. Or from cybersecurity, I forgot to put I, and you added I, or you even change it from a lower case to upper case, the integrity of the file has been modified, or the, the integrity of the file has been violated, right? And so there is something in cybersecurity that we call file integrity monitoring system. It's, it's one of the secret solution tools that actually um, um, investigate or scan for any file integrity monitoring, right? Say, for instance, if a file has been modified, it might be as small as changing the name of a file or changing it from PDF to TXT documents. Any little change at all, you definitely get different hash value. And the algorithm you, are, you see here is, is um, the the latest algorithm, we have MD5, we have SHA-1, we have RC4, different algorithm for hashing, right? No, RC4 is not a national algorithm, but we have MD5, we have SHA-1, we have SHA-128, but this 256 is one of the secret algorithm for hash technology. Um, I would not promise that I would teach you the different techniques of algorithm because it's like the the theoretical part of security. However, I might just maybe help with a video link or a document that you can actually read and just understand how this algorithm works and how this hash value works too. But that is a, um, a practical scenario of checking for integrity of a file. Another, another example would be, I think I opened something here and um, yeah, Another example would be because at the end of this training, I'm going to tell us to download some, um, some um, applications, right? And say, for instance, where you stay, you don't really have good internet or the network connectivity is a bit poor. You're not so sure if you've downloaded the full file part or the, the, the full application installer. You might want to check for the integrity of the file because some most sites will tell you this is the hash value for this file. So after downloading the particular documents, you are expected to compare the hash value of the file the vendor provided with one you downloaded to be sure that nothing is missing from the file package. And an example would be a Kali Linux. Let me show us Kali, Kali Linux um, this thing. Say for instance, I'm trying to download let me click on this and let us see what we have. Um, a 
64 bit Kalinin NOS installer. If you see something here, there is a sum. This sum gives us the SHA256 hash value, right? So if I click on download, this is a 2.8 gig file. Once I download this particular file, and I'm not too sure if it downloaded correctly, you can just go to your PowerShell, locate the file to your downloads, and compare the hash value to the one provided by Kali Linux to be sure nothing has been tampered with. So it's not until when somebody manually modify a document, it might be like a network problem, right? And you didn't get the full parts or the full, yeah, the full part of the file. You might want to check to be sure that you have the right package before you install that particular Kali Linux. So that is um, file integrity in a nutshell. Um, any question before we start to this class. Okay, I assume we all understand integrity and um, hash value, right? Okay, so today we'll be talking about um, vulnerability management. And um, just because I try to change the, the training path, just, you know, and um, during the course of the week, I was just thinking, what can I teach us? And that will still be valuable, or that will even be more valuable than um, what we initially planned. And I thought of telling us about all the processes in, in cybersecurity, for instance, or as a security analyst, I mean, what do we do? What are the key processes that we, that we do, like in day-to-day -day, um, day -day activities when you are a security analyst or a security engineer or so, or, and so forth. So I'm just going to tell us about the, the most effective um, processes in, in a cybersecurity program. And one of them is vulnerability management. And vulnerability management is, like I said, there's one of the key services in um, cybersecurity operations program to improve organizational security posture. Security posture means we are trying to ensure that our security controls are tight, right? So there is something we call security score or secure score in cyber security. And depending on the vendor, for instance, Microsoft will tell you um, our secure score is 50. Let me see if we can see an example of how Microsoft define their security score. Okay, this is this is an image, right? So I think this is one of Microsoft Security Suite products. I think this should be Microsoft Defender. Yes, like exactly. Microsoft Series Five Defender is one of Microsoft's um, security suite for defending up like antivirus tools, right? And so every organization that have a Microsoft um, um application or that purchases this particular application normally as a security analyst there is something you normally check for every day which is just your secure score right the secure score this particular example secure score is 47.23 that means it's medium in a way and i think if you want to increase your secure score like 70 80 90 is by remediating a lot of vulnerabilities, remediating a lot of issues in the organization's scarf of vulnerabilities and remediating them. And an example would be Microsoft is saying by breakdown that your security posture for identity is 60.71%. It's not it's strong, but it's not that strong. And for your devices, it's 45.02, meaning that your device has some issues that you need to fix or you need to implement some security controls, right? And as well as your applications, maybe you are running an obsolete application that you need to update. Maybe a vendor already releases a new application and you're here to update it or upgrade it in your organization. It's kind of reduces your security score. And um, well, ever since I've been working, I wouldn't have been able to achieve a security score of 80% or 90%. It's always been medium or 70, 70 something but it always gets better as you um, improve that. So vulnerability management is, is one thing, is a process that you can be sure that could help um, 
a company increases or improves is or yeah, a security posture, right? And so today we'll be talking about vulnerability management, how it works and everything. And next week, we'll definitely, I mean, at the end of the class, I will tell you to download some, some um, applications and then we can run vulnerability management next week. We'll do the practical aspects next week. So today we're talking about vulnerability management, what is vulnerability threat and risk, how are these vulnerabilities being, being rank, ranked and categorized, the processes involved, the vulnerability assessment scan, vendors, and the platform for this particular um, um, learning path. Okay, what is vulnerability management? In talent, it's saying vulnerability management is the ongoing regular process of identifying, assessing, reporting on, managing and remediating cyber vulnerabilities across endpoints, workload and systems. Um, a strong vulnerability management program uses stress, intelligence and knowledge of IT and job operations to prioritize risk and address vulnerabilities as quickly as possible. Yeah, let me just explain your process. Vulnerability management is all about, we have a particular weakness in our organization, a vulnerability. vulnerability Okay, let me even start here. Vulnerability is when there is a weakness in an asset, right? Or when there is like a loophole in your, in your, in your, in your organization assets or endpoints, that is a vulnerability. An example would be, um, say for instance, as a lady, you have a dress and the zip has like an opening that means it's risky for you to wear that dress out because it can just open up while you're on your way out. So it is a weakness, right? That alone is a weakness. And then a threat means if somebody pulls you, maybe the, the, the zip is weak, but you still think you can manage the zip by just maybe trying to adjust the way you work and everything. And unfortunately, as you are going, you jump, you try to use the bus or train or anything. And um, unconsciously, somebody just eats you or pull, you or pull your clothes. That means because the zip is already weak, right? That zip can actually be exploited. So a threat is something that can exploit a vulnerability. A threat would be somebody trying to pull, pull your clothes and the zip will be wide opened, right? That is a threat because you can't, you can't say, okay, I'm going to manage this zip to, to the office today. Because you're going to use a public bus, or you're you either going to climb a staircase or you're going to move your body, you're not too sure. That means there are different threats around that vulnerability, which is your weak zip, right? And that means that threat can exploit, can open the zip. So a vulnerability is there is a weakness in an asset. An example would also be my Windows PC has um, outdated um, security updates, for instance, and I did not bother to um, patch my system, right? Like update the security, um, the security updates, right? And say for instance, Microsoft realizes that anybody that uses Windows 7, they are prone to a particular kind of attack, say remote code execution attack. That means there is a threat in place already on that particular vulnerability. And so what Microsoft does is to release a patch and say, guys, you need to quickly patch your system if you're using Windows 7 or if you're using Windows 8, for instance. Windows 7 is even out of service, right? And um, a risk is what happened when a threat exploits a vulnerability. That means, like I was using the example of you having a weak zip and somebody pull your button, right? A risk is determined by saying, what is the probability that you will meet someone that will pull your shirt and then the zip will be widely open. So how do we evaluate risk? Risk is vulnerability times threat. An example would be if, um, how do I put it? If, if your vulnerability scanner is saying, you have port 80 opened on your web application. And you know that this port, what port 80 does is, what port 80 does is, you definitely send like a clear text 
or whenever you input your username and password, it is shown neglected. It is not encrypted, right? However, you think this particular port 80 being open on our web application will only be used internally. So do you think there will be a threat that could expect that vulnerability? You might say the threat level is low, is maybe one or one percent. But if that web application is to be accessible externally, and you guys are collecting username and password of, 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 of your client, of your customers, that threat level would definitely be high. That means if an attacker or, or somebody is trying to sniff, I mean, um, a web communication, that person could actually see that username and password in a clear text. So that means the threat is high. And so what is the risk? The risk will be that vulnerability times threat. So if vulnerability is, is 20 and the threat is one, the risk is 20. If a vulnerability is 20 and the threat is 10, the risk is 200. So that means, okay, the risk of a threat value of 10 is higher than the uh, um, um, a, a risk of threat value of one. A vulnerability, you might not fix it if you think there is no threat, right? Like, okay, we can still, we can still contain the vulnerability within the environment and there's no need for fixing, okay? And I'm going to tell you about this. I was talking about threats being one, vulnerability being zero. How do you know the severity rating, the, 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 the score of a particular vulnerability? So there is something we call CVSS. In vulnerability, we use CVSS, we use CVE, we use CWE, CPE, NVD, all those acronyms. I'm just going to show us some things on the internet to just explain all these um, acronyms. CVSS is Common Vulnerability Sec um, Scoring System. So for instance, if you scan a particular IP address or you scan a particular endpoint or a particular web application in environment, um, what all these vulnerability assessment tools does is they kind of give it a severity rating and CVSS score, right? And what they do is they try to assess it based on the threats, the vulnerability and the risk and just give you the results. And as a security analyst or as a vulnerability management response analyst, you're expected to assess this particular results, analyze it, remediate it, or tell asset owners to remediate that particular vulnerabilities. I will definitely show you how this works. So CVSS is, um, if it's severity rating is non, the CVSS score is 0.0. If severity rating is low, the CVSS score is 0 0.1 to 3.9. For medium, 4.0 to 6.9. High from 7.0 to 8.9. And critical from 9.0 to 10.0. Um, what this means is that if you scan a particular asset and it has 50 vulnerabilities, as a vulnerability manager or as a security analyst, you're expected to assess this vulnerability, you know, look at the reports and fix it based on the criticality level. Automatically, you will want to fix a critical and high vulnerabilities over a low vulnerability, right? Um, so before we continue, I just want to show us CVSS, CVID, and National, National Vulnerability Database. Um, let me start from, yes, I opened some documents. So, like I said, we have a lot of acronyms, CVE, CVSS, CWE. And it starts would be when you scan your environment, right? And um, you, when you generate a report, you definitely see something like CVE 2020-21958 or that kind of thing. And that is the CVID of that vulnerability. So each vulnerability has an ID and it's represented by a CV, common vulnerability and exposure. CV is the standard for uniform name convention and identification of publicly known security vulnerability information system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's so CV, CV just gives you like full information about the vulnerabilities. And let's look at the structure of CV from this um, screen. The CV, which is a prefix, represents the ID of that vulnerabilities. And this 2019 represents the year. Year in sense that year of publication, not the year 
when vulnerability was discovered. Let me even kind of give you like a bit of background on vulnerabilities. Say for instance, you are an ethical hacker or you're an hacker or something, and you just test for, okay, your Facebook releases a new feature, right? And you, because of your flair for, um, for, for security, you tested that particular feature and you notice that there is a weakness in the application. And this was 2022 January. You report, no, this was 2021. Don't let me even say months. You reported this um, weakness to Facebook, right? At 2021. However, Facebook, you know, you didn't, you didn't publish it to, to public. You, you, you reach Facebook directly and say, you have a particular issue on this new, new feature that you released. And once Facebook um, confirmed the, the vulnerability and everything, you know, it might be like a monetary time or whatever. I don't know how that works, depending on, um, they normally call it a bug, bug bounty program, right? And so what Facebook does is to release a patch, you know, they try to fix that particular issue. However, they could not release that patch 2021 December. They release, they release the patch 2022. So if Facebook is not telling people that uses the application to upgrade or update their application, the CV ID would be CV 2022, because that was the year the vulnerability was and um, the fix was published. I mean, all, all that was all that was publicly published, right? 2022. So that is the year of the vulnerability. And numbering is just like an ongoing process. It's okay, we are releasing a version one, a version two, a version three of this um of this fix. So it could be four digits, it could be five, it could be six, it could be seven. But this one, for example, is, is a four digit numbering. So it's just like you see in CV ID. Let me see. Let's just say example of vulnerabilities. I'm just trying to, oh, okay, this will not work. Okay, let me come to MV hiding, right? Okay, let me come to MVD. MVD is National Vulnerability Database. That means, say for instance, in your organization, you use Oracle, and you want to check the latest vulnerabilities, and because you just want to quickly fix those vulnerabilities, because you're a vulnerability manager, in the organization. And I type Oracle as, as a product and I search. Can you see this vulnerability ID represented as CVE? When the results came, my survivor that called me I Can you please meet your screen? Okay, thank you. So, if you can see this, when I search for vulnerabilities on a particular in a on the particular vendor Oracle, you could see that the vulnerability ID is represented by CVE, Common Vulnerability Exposure, the year when the vulnerability was being published, publicly published, and the number. This one is four digits. I, as I was showing initially, this one was four, and this one is five. Um, yeah, this one is five. It could be as long as five, six, seven digits, right? So, um, how does this work in 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 an, in an organization settings? I would say, what we do or what I do is, you can actually plug in this NVD that contains information of all vulnerabilities, right? You can plug it in. You can ingest all the vulnerability data into your own vulnerability um, solution in the as work or into a particular application like say Jira. Jira, you can use Jira for tracking vulnerabilities or tracking anything. Or, or so like a service tickets, um, um, a service tickets application, right? And so if you use 
micro um oracle for instance that means you can get anything around oracle vulnerability database from nvd because nvd compile all vulnerabilities across all vendors and this is what everybody uses any organization you can come here to check for a particular vulnerability an example would also be like microsoft we all know that microsoft releases um they releases security patch updates every second tuesday of the month right so second tuesday of the month that means they will definitely release another one on the 12th right so let me just type microsoft for um and search these are cvids so this that means even before the patch before the patch tuesday they already have some vulnerabilities around a lot of things the microsoft edge um, vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities it could actually do, um, do something elevation of privilege vulnerability that means if your organization is exposed to this kind of vulnerabilities and he, a, a threat actor could exploit this so the other for instance has a username and password that can only just do normal things right and as a threat actor if i have access to adela's credential I can elevate Adela's privilege to an admin and perform whatever I want to do. So that means they are saying if you run Microsoft Edge Chrome based, you need to update this because this, this was published April 05, 2022. That means your, your um, asset is being exposed to this kind of vulnerabilities. Have they released this patch? I don't know, right? However, if you look at the CVSS core, the CVSS score in this case is 8.3 and it's showing high. And if you look at what I showed us here, 8.3 falls between the range of 7.0 and 8.9. When I said this is a standard CVSS score rating, everybody uses a standard, every, every organization in the old world we use a standard one. There is nothing like, okay, because we are a small company, if it's between one and two, it will be none, no you have to follow the general guidelines of CVSS score. So for this particular vulnerability that we just opened now, the CVSS score, what is it? The CVSS score is 8 8.3, which is I, right? Uh, let me go back in again. Yes, it's 8.3, which is I. Another would be, look at this particular one's proofing vulnerability. The CVSS score is 4.3, and they said it is medium. When you come here and compare it, 4.3 falls between the range of 4.3 and 6.3, and 6.9, and it is medium. So it is a standard, standardized um, vulnerability ranking and um, categorization. So we have CVSA, which is Common Vulnerability Security score, um, Secure Score. We have CVE that shows the ID of vulnerability, common vulnerability um, enumeration. We have CWE. CWE is common weakness enumeration. So CWE is, let, let me just, let's type CWE. I don't want to just give us terms offhand. CWE, common weakness enumeration. That means it shows up like a list of software or, or, and hardware weaknesses. And um, when I come here, um, I just want to give us an example of latest version of CWE. And my software development. Trying to look for a, a common vendor that I can um, yes. Um, I can't think of any right now. But like I said, common weakness enumeration it shows us the list of vulnerable software and I mean vulnerable software and hardware. That's CW. We also have what we call CPE. CPE is um common platform enumeration. That means a particular platform that has vulnerability, e.g. Windows, Windows 20, let me do CPU. Common. No. 
CP. Yes, come off platform innovation. And let's see what they have to say here. Um, I'm just looking for a simple term. Let me get a simple term of CP for you. I'm just trying to lay foundation of vulnerabilities right before we even move into the practical aspect. Um, common platform enumeration, there's no definition. Here. Yes, it's a standardized method of describing an identified class of application operating system and hardware devices present among an enterprise computer system. It's still a way of saying there's a vulnerability on a particular application, on a particular OS. But generally, all these vulnerabilities are represented by a particular ID called CVE. And you can rate this vulnerability using the CVSS score, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. And there is also what we call severity rating. We have the non, low, medium, high, and critical. So those are the standardized common terms and um, secure, um, secure score using vulnerability terms. Um, yeah. Any question? Don't, I don't know if I've been able to explain all this. Any question before we move to the next slide? Question, question, yeah. Yeah, so I got a little bit lost, I won't lie. Um, so okay. when we're talking about the vulnerabilities cause, say, common weakness and immersion. So are we, are we saying that we use both CWE, CPE, C, like do we test these things on say all? Okay, all no, 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 we don't get to test them. However, the reason I'm trying to explain all the CV, CD, CPE, CW, CVSS is once you launch your vulnerability scan assessment tools, right? And you scan a vulnerability, the way the result will display most of these results will give you CVID, CVSS score, severity, just for you to understand what all these things stands for. And so while doing your assessments, while reviewing the reports, you, you know what you are looking at and you know where you can actually do this confirmation. Say for instance, it's saying CV 2021-19898 and you don't know much about it. You can go to NVD database and you, and input that CVID to read more about the vulnerabilities, right? So it's just like the common terms being used in, in, in vulnerability management, but you don't need that. You, you might not even use it at all, but I'm just trying to give us like a, a bit of information about all that. Yeah. Okay. All right then. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Sorry, Ma, I have a question. Okay. Okay. Ma, what do we use to scan for this vulnerability? Like, which software do you use? I know about okay. Aconetics and Nexus. Is there something else? Yes, we have a lot of vulnerability management tools. Definitely, we will discuss that. You will definitely see that um, at the end okay, of okay. the class. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? <laughs> Any other question? <laughs> Yeah, I see. So when you discover a vulnerability, it, yeah. you will you exploit it, or you have to determine the um, severity rating for you to know whether so, it is exploitation. So what most vulnerability assessments can to does is when, when when they tell you that you have a vulnerability, say vulnerability CVID twenty twenty one one nine eight nine, right? That vulnerability assessment tool, when you, once you download the report, will also tell you that this vulnerability is exploitable. There is a tab called exploitable, either yes or no. Do you understand that? That is for the uh, automated mm -hmm. process for vulnerabilities, yes. And mm -hmm. another manual process will be, will be in sense that, say for instance, we have a web application that we want to launch next month and we contracted that web application pen testing to a pen tester, either internal or external, and they came back with the results, right? That means they, also, they might have also used vulnerability assessment tool to do their scanning, right? And they got this result, and this tool is telling them that this particular vulnerability is exploitable or not. But they, what they do is to now exploit that vulnerability 
and tell you as a security analyst that this bad vulnerability can be exploited. Or they don't even use vulnerability assessment tool. And because of the web application, there's something we call the first 10 OWAPs. And they try to do security assessment on this particular application using the first 10 OWAPs that we'll definitely talk about during the course of this training and how it works and maybe show you some practical examples of how you can um, you know, um, detect the security um, um, issues using the first 10 OWAP. So the automatic process of vulnerabilities is using, is using a um, assessment tool. And this assessment tool will show you all these things. You have 10 vulnerabilities, you can exploit five. And um, five is not exploitable. Even Microsoft itself, for instance, let me show you something. Um, let's, let's escape this and go to, let's, let's, I'm big on Microsoft, right? Microsoft um, security patch. Last was March 2022. I told you the releases. Okay, let's come here. I just want to show you something. Can you see the way Microsoft even um, represented their vulnerabilities? CV 2020 with a particular number and the likes. So um, Microsoft also uses KB to name a particular um, patch update, right? Um, I'm looking for recent security update. Uh, let me just click on one, I'll see how this, okay. This is a security update for Windows Server 2008 Service Pack 2, and they releases it 2002. They should say, talk about this vulnerability. Um, they should talk about it, actually. They will tell you if it's exploitable or not. Is it high or low? Um, looking for a recent one. So this recent, let me check this mostly roll up. Important series windows. Okay. Um Microsoft is telling us that this particular vulnerability is critical. No, this is not. I need their monthly. How can I go down and get some of this? Monthly updates. Um, Hmm. There is this page that I'm gonna get some guys or something now. Um, security updates. Yeah. This is security updates release notes. Oh, this was what we saw in the Microsoft Edge we saw on NVD database. Can you confirm it now? Let me go back. Microsoft search. Um, this was CV 2022-2516. Okay, the education of privilege, 26912. So six nine one seven. Can you see the in the elevation of privilege um, vulnerability? And Microsoft is saying that the severity is moderate. They use the term moderate here. Let's see what NVD uses. NVD is saying this vulnerability, this two six nine one two is high, but Microsoft as a vendor. They're telling you that the vulnerability is moderate. 
that the severity is not high, right? I don't know why they change it though. It's a six now also. Let me see the CV. The CVSS score must be the same. Let's see the CVSS score. Okay. Can you see exploited? They put no here, right? Like you have spots. I still want to show us the CVSS score of this particular vulnerability, 8.3. Can you see 8.3? And when you look at MVD, MVD is also saying the CVSS score is what 8.3. So it's the same information across across board. The CVSS score here is 7.3. And when you look at the National Vulnerability Database, it's saying 7.3. But that's, that, and that vulnerability cannot be exploited according to Microsoft. So you know if it can be exploited or not. A vulnerability assessment um, tool can indicate that. But if it's a manual um, security assessment testing, a pen tester will definitely tell you if he or she is able to exploit the vulnerability. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any question? Any question? Any question? Okay, I will take that as a no. So, um, vulnerability management process, right? Um, I don't know how this got in. Maybe somebody give okay, somebody access. The integrity of this file has been has been violated. <laughs> Maybe somebody has access to this um, the, um, PowerPoint and, oh, this is not me, you know. Anyway, so for vulnerability management process, um, I will just explain how this works. This is not the technical part. This is just like how the process in, in, in a typical organization and the pre-work phase, I mean, what you do before you, you can even say you want to scan a particular um, application or you want to launch your vulnerability assessment tool is to determine the scope of the program. Scope of the program, it says that. So you work with First Bank. First Bank has different network devices. They have different application, web application, mobile application. They have endpoints for their customer, their employees, right? They have a lot of servers and everything. And First Bank has different branches, you know, they're in Lagos, they're in Abuja, they're even outside of Nigeria. Or UBA, let me use UBA, I'm sure UBA, UBA also has some African countries like Ghana and the likes and the likes. So you want to determine the scope of the program. What is the scope of vulnerability? Okay, we want to just scan or do vulnerability assessment on our servers, headquarter, servers or server that connects to headquarter alone. And the IP range is between 10.1.1.1 to 10.2.2.2, that kind of a thing. The scope of the program. So that means we are not scan or we want to do vulnerability assessments on all endpoints for employees at the head office or for employees at VI branch. If there's anything called like VI branch or Lekki branch, you determine the scope of the program. And you might even say you want to do it general-wide, like bank-wide bank vulnerability assessments, right? And then you define roles and responsibility in the sense that, okay, you are, you are a security analyst, you've gotten the scope of the program that you just need to scan five servers or do vulnerability assessment on, the, on five servers. However, you need, to understand, you need to evaluate who are the asset owner of that five servers. Server A might be a mobile application server. Who is the information? Um, who, who, who is it like information? Um, how do I put it? Asset owner or data custodian or data owner of the particular server, right? Server two is um, credit bank application. Who owns that credit bank application? What departments, right? You need to understand who are the custodian of this, or the data owner of this particular um, server that you want to scan. And the reason being that 
if you scan server one to server five, and you notice that there's a particular weakness, and say for instance, maybe you're the one that also remediate vulnerability in your organization, or you have to take it to asset owner, or even asset owner, even if asset owner cannot remediate the vulnerability, you will need to inform them that, okay, at this point in time, so 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 date, will remedy this vulnerability by upgrading your server to a newer version. They have to be aware of that. You can't just upgrade a server without their um, approval. And that's to even go through change management process. There is change management process in an, in an organization where you detect an issue and you want to fix it. They will tell you to fix it on a test server. And once you're done with fixing on a test server, you have to have like a rollback plan and also do tests on that test server to, to ensure that that fixing does not affect application. And then before a change is being signed off, then you now replicate that particular remediation or, or solution to the production server. So you need to understand rules and responsibility. If I understand about particular vulnerability, who do I talk to? How do we fix this? Who's going to fix a particular issue, right? And then you now select vulnerability assessment tools. That is, say for instance, with this server one to five, do we want to do like a manual form of testing, like a pen testing on this server one to five? Or do I want to use a vulnerability assessment tools like Nessus, Collis, you know, manage NG and the likes? And um, you have to create and refine policy and SLA. So does that mean that if server A has five critical, four critical, and 10 mediums, are we okay with that? Or what is your policy saying? Is your policy saying before you roll up, you roll out to production environments, you have to fix critical and high, and you can see do with mediums, right? You need to understand the policy SLA around that particular um, server. An instance would be, okay, for instance, in, in my current place of work, we have, different applications because we deal with different merchants and different banks. And so if there is a new release or a new feature on a particular application, it undergoes security assessment. And that means I take that, define the scope of the pen testing, take it to, to our pen tester. And once our pen tester comes back with the results, maybe one I one medium, five lows and the likes, some clients, some banks will say, you cannot deploy this application to production if you do not fix all critical high and medium, right? And if low vulnerability is less than theory, that is when you can deploy. Another client will say, for one application, you can only fix critical and high, we can still do with medium and, I mean, do it with medium and low. So it's, you have to understand the policies that guides each um, um, assets or services. And from your roles and responsibility, you understand, okay, this person, this particular application is critical. And that means we cannot even, there must not be any vulnerability. Even the low ones, we have to fix it. So you need to understand the policy and SLAs around applications, you know, around your assets, your servers, and the likes. And then you now identify the assets context sources. Asset context sources might be um, the source of this particular asset. Yeah, source. What's the source? Is this an internal um, um, application, external application? You know, just a lot of information around that before you carry on with the technical parts. You know, as a technical person, we are so quick to just, okay, run vulnerability assessment on this particular IP. We just click and run. We are not even sure. You know, vulnerability assessment tools can be intrusive at times, right? And most times, me, what I do, or uh, depending on that particular asset, say your web application, like UBA online marketing application, for instance, you know, customers, they log in, maybe, you know, clients do transaction more during the day. It does not make sense for us to now run vulnerability assessment on that particular application during the day. So we can just say, okay, maybe Saturday, right, Saturday midnight, between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m., we want to do some upgrade. And that's why you see banks saying, oh, from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., you will not be able to access a particular application. That means 
they might have discovered a vulnerability and they are trying to upgrade or update something. And that might affect the, the you know, how the application works, right? So most of the time, depending on when you when you determine all this pre-work phase, right, the SLA involved and everything, the scope of the program, you might be, you will you be able to decide, can I run a scan on in the afternoon or during working hours, or can this be done during weekend? And that also goes to remediation. When you want to do an update and upgrade, you have to determine, okay, if I do this during working hour, what would be the effects on customers, on availability? And that takes us back to CIA, right? Availability. Just because I want, just because Microsoft is saying, I have, okay, I've not updated my, my match security patch update on my PC. And now we are actually doing this training. And because I want to be secured, right? I want everything to be secure. And I just click on restart. That means I will definitely disrupt this class today, right? And I've violated the availability chain of cybersecurity. So it's not even about, I need everything to, see, to be secure. You have, it's, it's, you have to kind of balance it, security and availability. I mean, you have to balance the CIA part. If we try to secure this thing and say, only Adela can have access to this particular, um, um, particular presentation, that means every other person will not have access to it. And because, why? Because I'm saying I want it to be secured. I only want one user to have access to this. And it's disrupting others from having access to this particular slide. So you have to balance it. And it's in, in every organization, like, there is always a risk department. And they will say, OK, this vulnerability, this particular application has critical vulnerabilities. And we know fully well that if we update this particular vulnerability, it will disrupt everything. Say, for instance, your banking application, if we update it, if we switch to TLS 1.3, for instance, from TLS 1.2, some, there are some dependencies that would break. And that means we cannot even up upgrade it now. And it is critical. What do we do, right? And that's why you, you now need to start thinking about risk assessments. Do we need to mitigate this? What other controls can be put in place? You know, um, um, do you want to accept the risks? Do you want to fix it? Or do you want to contain it? A lot of things. And this week, next week, and the week three and week four, it's all about vulnerability risk assessment and threat assessment. So I'll definitely kind of make you understand how the process works better. And so this is everything about and the pre-work phase of vulnerability assessment. Who will manage the program, the risk and responsibility, when a vulnerability is detected, how long do we have to remediate, right? Okay, we have this, and your IT admin is saying they cannot update now because it's going to affect so, 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 so. And you as a vulnerability as, as, as a security manager, you are saying, okay, we need to update this thing within three months. Or based on your SLA policy, SLA is saying, if you have high vulnerabilities, it must be fixed within 30 days. In my organization, we say critical must be fixed within the first seven days. I must be fixed within the first 14 days, medium within the first 30 days, and low within the first 60 days. It's, it varies across organization, you know, because our, our how do I put it, our security, um, I'm trying to remember this term, like the way we accept things is different, right? The security landscape is different. It, it depends on how critical or what kind of business you do. Right, so it's all varies across organizations. So you need to understand policies around around the assets. You need to understand the SLA around the assets, and what sort of software do we need to effectively manage this scan? Like, like I said, do you need to do a manual scanning or a automated scanning? And for automated scan, do you think this also be sufficient or qualities or whatever tools you have in place? And then the list of assets that you plan to scan, which is the scope of the program, you know. That's 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 it about that. And we have this many circle is this is it from discover to prioritization to assessing to report to remediation, and then we verify and you discover. So, e.g., I'm scanning IP address 192.168.1.1, right? Or I want to scan, like I said, scope of the program is server one to server five. Let me use IP address from 10.1.1.1 to 10.255.255.255. And then um, what your vulnerability assessments tool will do is to discover 
between this 10.1.1.1 to 10.255.255, what are the assets? Let's discover these assets. And we have what we call Nmap scan. They do some Nmap like IP config, I mean, IP ping, like it does some pinging. Is this assets available? Is it online? Or Nmap, do we have a particular port open? You know, a lot of in processes in place. And this is what Sikaka does. They they use all these commands to 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 test for the presence to, to test for the presence of a particular asset and what kind of ports being open is this asset available and all the likes. We definitely do this. Yes, I promise that we will do this during the course of the training, not today, but during the course. Of, just show you some medical hacking tools and yeah, we definitely definitely um install calendars and do some little things around that. Prioritize assets means okay. We have server one to five. However, we only have 24 hours to be able to do something. And server one to five, server two is like the most critical part um, asset, right? Okay, let's, and it's a valuable one. That means if my mobile, if our mobile application is offline today, or if somebody's able to exploit something or this particular vulnerability, it's going to affect bank and and that also affects, you know, customer reputation and the likes. So you have to value the asset. You have to scan based on the asset value. How much does this work? This particular asset, if it's down today, what impact does it have on our business? So you have to prioritize assets. And if you think you have the capacity or the capability or the or the time to to do to do all asset discovery or to scan all the vulnerabilities, then you, you might not need to prioritize, but you still have to prioritize even when it comes to fixing. Say for instance, you even scan server one to five, and then server one to five has 150 vulnerabilities. And now your, your developers are busy developing some application, net admin, they are busy, system admin, they are busy. And this vulnerabilities is 150, and you need them to fix because you cannot fix everything yourself depending on your scope of work, you have to prioritize it based on the severity, you know, okay, there is critical. You have to prioritize based on is it expectable or not, right? So that means the non expectable one can still move down the stream and it can be done later on in, 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 I mean, in the pipeline. You, have, you also have to prioritize based on the criticality of the assets. If this asset goes down today, if an hacker hacks this particular application, we need, what is the effect? you know, monetary effects, reputation effects on the organization. So you have to prioritize them and then you fix based on priority. And um, when you prioritize them, you ass assess, in this case means, as a vulnerability manager or as a security analyst, you, you are the one assessing these particular vulnerabilities. Like, you know, you are prioritizing and you assess, okay, this one has CVSS of, of 10, this one has CVSS of two. You know, you assess the vulnerability based on the, um, this, the secure score, the value of the assets, you know, how important it is in your organization, and you come up with a report, right? And once you come up with the report, in your report, because when you were doing your pre-work phase, you've identified the role and responsibility of that particular asset, right? Then you talk to, okay, this particular vulnerability should be assigned to network admin. This should be fixed by a developer. You assign it to a developer to that department. But because we've been able to identify this responsibility initially, at the report stage, you wouldn't have a problem. My, and, and my experience around this is, when I was working with Fidelity Bank back then, I, you know, it's, you know when you join the company, it might take time for you to understand who owns a particular asset, who does this, who does that. And so when it's kind of vulnerability and we, we find some issues and the likes, and while I was trying to prioritize assets and do my assessments, I found it difficult because at the end of the day, I was assigning a wrong vulnerability to the wrong owner, right? So, and then maybe say for instance, I found like 200 vulnerabilities. In my departments, we undo security updates, patch updates, you know, some anything on the server end, but on application end and on, and on network end, we cannot do it, but if it's on the endpoint and the sub, uh, the endpoint particular, if it's an endpoint vulnerabilities, when, when it comes to upgrade updates, we do that. So I assign that to security team, 
But if vulnerability has to do with a network devices in which we have a network admin that, that handles that, or it has to do with application in which we need a programmer to change their code or tweak their code, you know, at that point, and because it's a bank, a bank now has different developers, you know, we have a lot of application and everything and everything. I was not, we have database, you know, I didn't understand this. I was assigning to the wrong, um, wrong access owner. And then I sent it as an email to them and say, fix this. You know, because these guys are busy, if you tell us to fix the particular vulnerability and it's not even meant for them, they might not even come back and say, Ellen, this is why it's not meant for us. They will just leave it and you assume that they are fixing it already. And after one or two, you should go back and say, give us an update. They will not tell you, no, this is not within my purview. You have to take it to sis and me, you know. And from then, it was so tiring because I was not like moving up and down, tossing me around. Oh, this is not within sis and me. It also be network admin and a lot of this. And reason being that I did not do what I did not do my pre-task phase initially before performing this vulnerability assessment. So it's kind of delayed your process. So it took me months to understand all these things. However, if I'd known today, now if I join a new organization today, what I will do before even running a vulnerability assessment solution or anything is to do my pre-work phase very well, understand the criticality of the assets, you know, the purpose of the assets, the roles and responsibility before now going through the assessment itself. And so once you do your report stage, then you remedy this by fixing, e.g. Microsoft releases a patch of this, you upgrade it and everything. And after fixing, you have to verify. Because at times you might think, okay, I've done this upgrade. They said open close port 443, and you've clo and closed port 80. You, you, you thought you already closed port 80, but you did not save it or apply that particular changes, right? And you just think I've done it without verifying you have not completed the process. You have to verify it by also what's running that particular, um, running a scan or that particular set again to, re to detect, okay, I would say, um, network admin and system said they fix 20 out of 30 vulnerabilities. Or out of the 150, you've been, able to, you've been able to fix 130. How do you know that verification? You have to verify by rescanning it again and ensure that you only have 20 vulnerabilities left. So it's it's a cycle. It's never it's never ended. Like you have to, you know, continue it like in a loop way. And that's why vulnerability management is like a key aspect of um, a server security program. In fact, companies have a dedicated vulnerability management team that does this. Imagine a big company like um, Goldman Sachs or something. You can know that they have a lot of assets, application networking devices, they, their cloud environment, their database, their data center, you know, they have a lot of assets. And I'm talking about thousands of assets. And imagine you handle thousands of assets and trying to remedy it, fix it. Now you have to do this like on a regular, uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. So for instance, Microsoft that does this every month, that releases patches every month, you might say, okay, but my basis for a particular scope, will be done every week, another one every third quarter. So before you know, your day is fixed up with vulnerabilities. Before you start engaging stakeholders, you have to argue about, even they will tell you that this particular thing is false positive, you go and confirm it. They will tell you, no, we don't have SSL version theory on our application. So you have to, you as a vulnerability manager, you have to confirm. And this might also involve manual confirmation. like. A scan is telling you this is this. You know, scan can also give you some false positive results, right? So you have to do some confirmation by logging into the particular application and check yourself. Take a screenshot and send to application and so you, can fi you must fix this. So it's not just you scanning and you're just sleeping. You do a lot of things, a lot of paperwork, a lot of... At times, you can even go to the extent of exploiting these vulnerabilities. If, if the scan is when you say it's exploitable, yes, and then because your developer is busy and he's saying, I cannot fix this, for him to fix it, you have to give him some extra evidence by exploiting it, right? And say, see, I can exploit this thing. Give him real evidence. And from there, he's going to fix. So it's a lot of process, a lot of process. You know, that's, that's a vulnerability management um, life cycle. 
Um, any question? I hope I'm not, hope it's not boring. No, it's not. It's yeah. not, but it's not, it's not, but that's right. That's right. It's not boring, but it's intense. Yeah, yes, you have to go back to the video and, you know, watch again. Yeah, sure. And that was why I said we we'll definitely use the next two, three weeks to do vulnerability assessment, trick assessment, because this is a department on its own, right? So, and at the end of the day, maybe what I will even do, our third week, we have to do an interview on vulnerability assessment. I will be the interviewer, all of you will be the interviewee. And I want us to be sure that we understand this process. And even if this is the only thing we can do in this mentorship program, I will show you jobs on vulnerability management alone. So I think that that would that would, I want us to really understand. I don't want us to rush um, through the through the process. Yeah, oh, really, yes, you are right. It's not easy for first timer. Um, not a problem. I perfectly understand that. But yeah, um, um, vulnerability assessment scan. Okay, so something. I would say is there is difference between vulnerability assessment and vulnerability management. Vulnerability assessment, right, is just um, the discovery phase or this assessment phase. When you discover is you prioritize your assets and you assess it for vulnerability, like you scan it, scan it phase. So from discover to assess, even I would even say this assess alone is vulnerability assessment. But the old program from discovering, prioritizing assets, reports, check and responsibilities, and all the likes that are the management life cycle that you that you hold as a vulnerability manager. So vulnerability assessments can you can scan network, like I said. Say for instance, when you scan a network and you have vulnerability around network, you talk to a network and mm -hmm. maybe talk to Cisco, talk to checkpoint firewall and all those kind of things. So fix this vulnerability. Both base scan could be something around your endpoints, your computer that you work with, right? You can, like workstations, servers, network hosts, like host machine, your, your VM where your hypervisor, your host base scans. We have wireless scan. In an organization where they use different, they have different wireless ports or wireless, um, wireless devices. So I would say for instance, this wireless scan, what I do for wireless scan, I, I don't use my vulnerability assessment tools for wireless scan. There is online tool that you can actually use to scan for rogue wireless access points. Um, let me note rogue wireless scan and maybe also give us some basic understanding of some, some um, definitions in, in, in cyber security. So an instance would be, let me just give us a quick explanation of wireless scan. You work with UBA or First Bank as our case study. And you know, UBA has big buildings and also definitely they have different wireless can, I mean wireless um, device in at each office and everything, if they're not using the wired one, right? And me as a um, malicious person or, or as a bad guy, I brush my own wireless device, right? And because I have this um, assess a, a tool that will scan for wireless nearby, the, even if you turn on your wireless um, communication, this thing, we definitely see different um, um, network that you can actually connect to. And so there is this network called First Bank Network, right? And you know, you, are, you, are, you, you work with First Bank, and every morning you just click on First Bank Network and just do connect, right? And I'm a malicious person, a malicious user. And I kind of, I brought my own wireless device and maybe fix it somewhere around the building. Fix it somewhere around the building. And I named that wireless device First Bank Network. And so tomorrow, as is actually resume, and you know, it's First Bank Network. Maybe you will sort to boy because you just want to connect and just start your work as usual. You might just connect to the rogue first bank network. And something about wireless access points is they ask for username and password, right? And just input your username and password. And because you connected to the rogue one, me as a bad guy, 
what I've done is capture your credential and I can use your credential for anything. And maybe you have access to your servers or some servers in the organization as it says, for instance, and maybe you don't really have a lot of privileges and look at that particular vulnerability that we saw that they said elevation of privilege. But because I have access to Azista credential, I elevated a privilege and I performed a lot of things, you know, with, with the, and Azizat's um, server or the server itself has that particular vulnerability, maybe it has the edge, the elevation of your vulnerability and they, they are yet to fix it in the organization. And because I'm able to use Azizat's credential to log into that server, I can elevate my privilege and, you know, I have a lot of, um, um, just, how do, I, how do I explain this? And just do a lot of things, I mean, malicious things, you know, maintain foothold, you know, create a new credential for myself because I have an admin credential, you know, try to encrypt devices or copy out confidential information, credit card information, a lot of things. That is, um, so for my analysts can, what we normally do as a security analyst or what you can do or, or what you will do is always try to have like a regular um, schedule where you go around your organization, you launch that wireless scan devices and scan for wireless, wireless devices around the network. And once you come out, you bring the results, right? And you, not, you will now analyze the results based on the list of wireless assets that you have and see if there is something that is malicious or not. So that you can quickly flag it and it will be deleted or you can um, kind of create security awareness for your staff member. So that's why I scan. Application scan is the personal application like web, app, web application, your online banking application, you know. There are some scanning tools that is basically for web application scan or scanning tools can do a lot of things. I will show you, I will definitely show you. And scanning tools also do, do database scan, like majorly on your database, that is find the weak points on database. We will show you that, I will definitely show you that. Um, vulnerability management tools in the market, like um, who asked, somebody asked for vulnerability management tools. So we have a lot, we have Nessus, like, Nessus is like, you know, the common one. We have Qualys, we have Beyond Trust, we have Manage Engine. This is just a screenshot from um, Google, but we have a lot of vulnerability management tools. However, if I think what most organizations use this, right? I'm sure of Nessus, I'm sure of Collis. Uh, on that one, I think OpenVerse. I think this OpenVerse is a free, okay, they have the free version and they have the enterprise version. But if you can even understand this too, because I've worked with four organizations. Of I don't know. I've used Nessus. I've used Nessus to, with two different organizations. I've used Collis with two organizations, and I'm usually with two organizations. So Nessus and Collis seems to be like, you know, and Rapid Seven. But the truth is, once you have um, knowledge about one, you are you are you are good to go. Even if you've not used Beyond Trust before, you've not used ERP scan before, or whatever, whatever. If you tell your um, employer that you you know Nessus, they will trust you to be able to use other tools. You know, when you can operate a Android phone, operating in iOS will not be an issue. Although you might find it a bit you know difficult. Or when, now I'm I'm big on Windows. By the time I use MacBook. Yes, I might still find some little things difficult, but definitely I can still do the basic things. And as I use it consistently, automatically I will be good at it. So we can start with Nessus or with Qualys or whatever, and they, they will definitely entrust you with other um, vulnerability management um, tools that they are using. So the platform for this vulnerability mentorship session is Nessus Vulnerability Scanner. And this of our is kind of because it's like we have the free version. I don't know of Qualys or, or other ones, but Nessus are they have the free version and the enterprise version. So against next week, um, I believe we all have a Windows PC or a Mac MacBook, right? 
I guess next week I would recommend that we download um, all this, your Windows, the, I, the ISO file for Windows, download VMware, right? Just the crack version or the, even if, even if it's trial version, we just need it for the purpose of this training and download Nexus Essential, right? And um, yes, if I say we should start doing it now, you know, we'll definitely waste time. Please, again, next week, ensure that you have all this downloaded. And next week, we will definitely install it together while installing, people can also be installing. And then we do some example of, I mean, we scan our environment. You will scan your Windows, for instance, or you scan your VMware. And then we can analyze the results together and we can see how this works. Is that fine? And um, lastly, um, last week I talked about a uh, uh, programming language, I saw security person. I found two useful sites. Um, they are both paid, right? But it's not that expensive. However, if you think you cannot pay, well, it, it all depends. It's, I wouldn't say you have to pay for it or not, just for personal training. You can look at these two sites. Um, what me I did for this particular one is this infosec, they have seven days trial. And within the seven days, just ensure that you learn Python for survival script within the seven days trial and just you know remove your credit card. You don't need to pay for this. But however, you might pay for this. Me, on the other hand, I'm using um, LinkedIn Learning because I have um, license to LinkedIn Learning for the beginner trainer for Python. But for Python for cyber security, I plan to use this because they have a seven days trial and it's 11 hours course. And I believe I should be able to complete the course within seven days. So that is recommendation for Python programming uh, language. Yeah, um, any question? Guys, ask question, ask question. Let me know if the class is boring you need something more or anything, how can we improve? Question, question, question. Um, the link, should I just, sorry, can we all drop our email address on the WhatsApp group, then I can share this with you or the links. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Any question, any question, any question? Okay, you said it's overwhelming. All right, I understand. But do we have any question? I'm very really pleased. Can you drop it on? I don't want us to do it here because this um, um, training will be shared on YouTube. And I don't want us to release some confidential information like our email address. So we do that on um, WhatsApp group. Yeah. So before we round up, I'm just going to show you something a bit confidential. However, it will not be on record, okay? So let's assume that we are done with today's class. However, still hold on, don't leave. Let me stop recording. Are you sure you want to stop?